I find that a lot of repair shops are nervous picking up an iron, and many don't offer these services at all. I think soldering is an essential skill when it comes to electronics repair and troubleshooting, and believe if you can turn a screwdriver, you can learn to solder. So today I want to show you a brief introduction to soldering. I've got this blank digital clock PCB I picked up on AliExpress for the price of a bar of candy and about a month of shipping time. I've also got a lot of parts which I can use to populate the board. I'll go over each one as I install them. Many of these kits don't label the individual components and you'll have to rely on the color coding of resistors to identify them. I'll be using unleaded rosin core solder with no additional flux. Your solder will typically list a working temperature, but most fall in the range of 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. First is the 4.7K resistors. You can tell by the sequence of colors. Yellow is 4, violet is 7, black is 0, and brown gives it a multiplier of 10, equating to 4700, shortened to 4.7K. A component list included in the package indicates that these are to be placed in positions R9, R10, R11, R12, and R20. These are through-hole components, meaning they have bendable wires known as leads protruding from them that will run completely through the board and are attached from the opposite side. In most cases, it's best to place components as close to the board as possible, though some builds will specify height for some parts. In the case of through-hole soldering, the lead is fed through what is known as a barrel. The barrel is very thin and will heat up very quickly when the soldering iron is pressed to it. Once the iron is pressed to both the barrel and the lead, solder can be fed into it, melting very quickly and joining the two components. Next up are the 10K resistors. There are four of these. The colors brown, black, black, red, are 1, 0, 0 with a multiplier of 100, ending up at 10,000 or 10K for short. They are to be placed in R16, R18, R19, and R21. I bent the leads prior to inserting them for a little bit better fit. These are again soldered from the opposite side. Solder can also be directly fed onto the iron if you need to move it somewhere quickly, though this causes the rosin to quickly evaporate, making the solder flow very poorly and become sticky. Next are the 330 resistors. Orange, orange, black, black gives us 330 with a multiplier of 1. Most modern devices utilize surface mounted resistors. These small blocks are typically printed with numbers indicating their values. These are to be installed in positions R1 through R8. A single 200K resistor is next on the list. I don't ask why they use that value, that's a question for an engineer. I just install it where they tell me. This one is going to land on position R13. On occasion, crisp dry solder will build up on your iron, leading to unwanted bridging and smearing. It's important to clean your tip periodically while working. The single 100K resistor is pretty drab with brown, black, black, and orange. It will go through the holes marked R14. Because resistors simply resist the current, they aren't polarized and can be installed in either direction. Capacitors are a different story. Finally, something cool, a 5516 photoresistor. These decrease in resistance based on the light they're exposed to, and the device can use this change in value for various functions. It will be installed in R15. Next up, we've got a pretty looking 10K thermistor. These clever resistors change in value based on the temperature they're exposed to. Devices can use this change to determine temperature of a component or the environment. I'll solder this into position R17. A single 3-pin header will go through the board next. The spot labeled ISP is its home, and despite one hole having a square printed around it, there is no wrong orientation of the pins themselves. One of the only surface-mounted components in this build is the AMS1117 integrated circuit. This has three small legs and one large anchoring leg. It'll go in position U3. I find these are easiest to install by soldering a single leg and holding the iron in place while you use the solder wire to align the component, and then release the heat. From that point, the other legs can be attached normally. 
By now I think you've got a bit more of a grasp on through-hole soldering, so I'll skip showing that process for the next few components. Even though my intrusive thoughts are telling me to eat these three ceramic 104 capacitors, these will be installed in C2, C6, and C7. In this instance, these capacitors are not polarized, and their direction does not matter. There are two smaller 5 picofarad ceramic capacitors. They are installed next to one another in C4 and 5. Now the science part, a tiny crystal oscillator. When electricity is applied, this crystal vibrates at a stable frequency of 32,768 Hz, which is often shortened to 32 kHz. This is used to accurately ensure that one second is actually one second. It is installed in Y2 like any other through-hole component. Next is the 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. This one is polarized, and it's designated in two ways. The wrapper shows the positive and negative sides, as well as the traditional longer lead being the positive leg. It is installed in position C3. Because these poke out where the LED will sit, it's important to trim them pretty short. The cool half moon shaped 8050 triode is next to be installed. Thankfully the board has a little drawing printed of which orientation to install it. It goes in position Q1. Looking nearly identical, it's the 8550 triode. We've got four of these to install. They'll go in positions Q2, Q3, Q4, and you guessed it, Q5. Two tactile vertical switches go on next. These are very clicky. They should be installed on the board in positions S1 and S2, short for switch 1 and 2. Makes you wonder what the Q stood for in the last step. These legs might dump heat into the chassis of the button, meaning the solder will harden faster or take longer to melt. A chunky singular DC socket is going to bring power to this board. It has three very large mounting feet with holes slotted for additional structural support. This is installed in the DC slot, and will take a hefty amount of solder to keep them firmly planted to the board. The protruding legs should not be trimmed. This 20-pin IC block is an interesting choice to include. Realistically, there's no reason the IC itself can't be directly soldered to the board. It doesn't need any interface, and it isn't a component that you would replace often, if ever. In any case, it goes in slot U1 and is soldered from the opposite side. Now, the also strangely selected 8-pin IC block it is also pretty redundant, as I am unlikely to perform maintenance on this clock once it's complete. Once placed in position U2, it can be soldered from the other side. Next up is the second surface mounted component, the battery buckle. It'll go in position BT1. Truth be told, I really like the way the components like this mount. They have huge flat pads, and once solder melts into them, it spreads rapidly and grabs the component's leg through an almost capillary effect. This is the loud buzzer or beeper that makes sounds when you interact with the device or enable the alarm function. It is installed in position LS1, except I'm not going to install this one because I don't like noisy things. There are four 1-inch digital tubes, this is just a fancy way of describing multi-segment digits. These should fall into positions DS1 through DS4. You'll notice that each digit has a single period or dot, and that the two on the right side of the board have the dot inverted, meaning it needs to be installed seemingly upside down. This will allow the two adjacent dots in the center to form a colon. Now there are 40 leads to attach from the back side. These leads don't need to be trimmed. Now I'll grab our last few components, the DS1302 8-pin integrated circuit and the STC Too Long For Me microcontroller with its 20 spiky pins. These will be pushed into their respective IC block headers. I still think these are a silly design, but again, I'm not an engineer. I just melt metal with a hot stick where they tell me. And finally, the 3 volt CR1220 battery is going to be put into the battery buckle, which will allow the oscillator to keep time even when the clock is unplugged. 
In any case, I hope this was a helpful introduction to through-hole soldering. Kits like these can be found for very cheap and are super useful for practicing. I have linked a similar one to this clock in the description below. Want to see me make more guides like this? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, and subscribe so you don't miss the next installment. And if you watched the video up to this point, thanks. I'll see you next time.